May God the Father who created this body, may God the Son who by his blood redeemed this body, may God the Holy Spirit who by baptism sanctified this body to be his temple, keep these remains until the day of the resurrection of all flesh. Those are the words spoken at the committal portion of our Lutheran funeral service. At that most somber moment, those words proclaim the truth about the relationship between God and your body. Your body was created by God. It was redeemed by his Son, Jesus Christ. And it has been sanctified by God's Holy Spirit. The committal service is, it's not just a way of getting rid of a body. It is actually taking a body that God himself created and returning it to his care with as much reverence and dignity as humanly possible. Your body is uniquely you, but it does not belong to you. You did not create it, nor could you ever redeem it. Only God can do those things, and he has done them both. For you. But one fact remains inescapable. We are flesh and blood creatures, and we will one day face death. That we have no control over. God alone decided when and where he would create you, and God alone will decide when and where he will bring you back to be with him. In the meantime, for the span of our lifetime, we have somewhat a great deal of freedom as to what we can do with our bodies. We can eat as much or as little as we like, we can exercise and try and keep it healthy or not. We can even control whether or not or when we will produce children. But we cannot control the, the deterioration and the consequences of disease and the process of aging. Now, there are some who believe that they, they can control that, that they have every right to control when and how their life comes to an end. It's called euthanasia, which is Greek for good death, or generally when it's on the books in state law, it's called physician-assisted suicide. Some states, some countries, give people the right to terminate their life if they decide they want to do that. <coughs> there have been people who have struggled with life-changing diseases, Lou Gehrig's disease, multiple sclerosis, other diseases that affect the body more so than the mind. And some of these people have traveled to states or to countries where they can legally put an end to their life. Their disease was not necessarily a terminal disease, 
But they, they just didn't like the situation they were in. And so they wanted it to stop. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul has a lot to say about our bodies and the relationship that God has with our bodies. <clears throat> the Corinthians, at the time of Paul, believed that there was a sharp distinction between physical matter, your body, and spiritual things, your spirit or your, your soul. And they had come to believe because of the, the numerous pagan temples that were in Corinth that they believed that they could do whatever they wanted to do with their body and it would not affect their spiritual condition, their soul, because there was that distinction between the two. They maintained that there was a complete separation between what you believed and how you worshiped and what you did to entertain yourself. That meant that for many residents in Corinth, there were virtually no boundaries, no limitations, no restrictions on what they were willing to do. Pagan temples of fertility, which were little more than prostitution, incest, even rape, these things were, were everyday experiences in Corinth. It seemed reasonable to them to do whatever they wanted to do. And believe it or not, that same thing <laughs> is still in the church today. A few years ago, the ELCA was at a crossroads. They were under pressure from our 21st century postmodern culture and the GBLT community. And they came to the church with this message. It is the gospel, baptism, and our mission that glues us together as a church, not the things that we do. Now, clearly, baptism and the gospel and their mission are important spiritual issues. But by proclaiming that, what they did at the same time was declare that sexual and moral ethics should not get in the way of their loving and caring for their people. So, what scripture clearly and repeatedly calls evil, they embrace because they decided it's not a spiritual issue. That is a cultural issue and if we want to remain relevant to our people we have to accept the cultural issues they are dealing with and so they not only accepted the GP, GBLT community but they encouraged them to become pastors and bishops and leaders in their church. <clears throat> now, in verse 13, Paul takes a clear and unambiguous position. The body is not meant for immorality, but for the Lord, 
and the Lord for the body. Paul was telling them that you can't take a body created by God, redeemed by his son, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, and unite it with evil pagan practices. Luther makes that point with eloquence to spare. Christ has purchased and won you from all sin, death, and the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and his innocent suffering and death, that you may be his and live with him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessing. Clearly, you and your body are immeasurably valuable to God. Your body will be raised on that last day. It will be glorified, and it will then, you being reunited, body and soul, will then live in the glory and the wonder of Christ in God's eternal kingdom. You belong to God. You are the dwelling place of God's Holy Spirit. You are destined to rise on that great day of the Lord and the day of the resurrection of all flesh. For now, Paul encourages us to present your body as a holy and living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable to him. Now this is a thing, a good deed or a a way of worshiping and honoring God that you can do every single day of your life. Give thanks to God for the glory that is your body and use it to his praise and glory. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding Keep your hearts and minds focused on Christ Jesus.